making our way towards the railway station. Many people ask why the railway station is so far from the city centre. The reason goes back to 1845, when the railway company wanted to link Cambridge with other major cities. The university, however, was not very keen on this idea, and they thought the students would take advantage of the railway and visit the distractions of London. The city war memorial of the junction was designed by Robert Tate Mackenzie. It depicts a young soldier looking towards the railway station, having returned victorious from the First World War. This is on the lower deck of this bus. Before we leave the railway station, could I ask you to remain seated at all times whilst the bus is in motion? There are several parts of the tour when the tree branches overhang the roadway. Only leave your seat when the bus is safely parked at a bus stop. Out of consideration to your driver and other passengers, can I point out that smoking is not permitted on any of our sightseeing buses, and all mobile telephones should be set to silent mode or switched off. Although many people think of the university when Cambridge is mentioned, we can trace the history and development of the city back many thousands of years to the Iron Age. However, it was the Roman invasion in the first century AD that really put Cambridge on the map. The Roman army marched through Cambridge many times on the road they called the Via Divana, which led from their headquarters at Colchester to the city of Lincoln to the north. They forded the river and built a fortified camp on the higher ground to the north of the city. This camp was gradually expanded throughout the period of Roman occupation in Britain, until in 410 AD, the legions were finally withdrawn to protect their homeland. We will be travelling along several sections of the original Roman road on our tour today, although it now changes its name eight times as it passes through the city. After the Romans, Cambridge was invaded next by the Saxons from northern Germany, who arrived around 450 AD. They established Cambridge as a centre for commerce and market trading. They were followed by the Vikings from Scandinavia, who arrived some 400 years later, and, true to their seafaring ways, gave Cambridge a thriving port. The river was still being used for trading until the early part of the 20th century. As we leave Station Road, on the corner is the new Microsoft Research Center. England came in 1066. William the Conqueror reached Cambridge with his army in 1068, and 
built a wooden bottom bailey castle, which was later rebuilt with stone. The castle bailey is no longer visible, but the mott or high bank of earth can be seen adjacent to Shire Hall in Castle Street and still offers sweeping views across the city. The history of Cambridge changed dramatically in 1209. Rioting in Oxford, which is always called the other place by local residents, forced students and teachers to flee for their lives. Legend has it that the rioting was caused when a group of students were practicing archery in Oxford and accidentally killed the townswoman. King John allowed the townspeople to take students hostage in revenge for the murder. Some students fled to Paris, some to Reading, and others settled here in Cambridge. The arriving students discovered a town much older than Oxford and found safety and sanctuary in many of the monastic buildings. Some of these buildings became our earliest colleges, and you will see many of these on your tour. The area of land on your right is the Botanic Garden of the University of Cambridge. This is the only department of the university that is officially open to the public. The garden was established in 1846 and is considered to be one of the most important in the country, second only to Kew Gardens in London. After we pass the museum, the college coming up on your left behind the iron railings is Peter House, founded in 1284. This is the oldest college in Cambridge and also one of the smallest. Famous alumni from Peter Hatz include Frank Whipple, who invented the jet engine, Charles Babbage, the father of the modern computer, and more recently Sam Mendes, the film director. If you look to the right, you will see Pembroke College, founded in 1347. The college chapel with the cupola on top was designed by Sir Christopher Wren, and was his first completed commission. Sir Christopher was a professor of astronomy at Oxford. Perhaps his most famous work is St Paul's Cathedral in London. A former student here was Britain's youngest ever Prime Minister, William Pitt the Younger, who took office at the age of 24. On the corner to the right is the Church of St Botolph. He is one of the patron saints of travellers, and his churches are traditionally located near to town entrance gates. On the corner of the tower you can see two sundials engraved into the stonework. on the right hand side as we cross the river. The mathematical bridge is built with straight pieces of timber and was constructed in 1749. Legend has it that originally the bridge was built on mathematical principles without bolts or nails, the adoration of the main. Although the view to your right is partially hidden by the trees, we will shortly be approaching the grounds of Trinity College. King Henry VIII merged King's Hall and the Highland House of Orgeons to make Trinity the largest and richest Cambridge college in the Trinity in 1546. The famous architect Sir Christopher Wren designed the library, which you may just see through the trees on your right. One of the most famous manuscripts housed here is the original handwritten copy of the children's classic, Winnie the Pooh. King Henry VIII merged King's Hall and Nicholas Colleges to make Trinity the largest and richest Cambridge College, founded Trinity in 1546. The garden on your right belongs to the master of St John's College. It's known as the Wilderness. The grass is only grown twice a year in order to let the spring flowers develop. Westminster College, which trains ministers for the United Reformed Church. 
The gold carving above the gate facing the roundabout is of a burning bush, and the Latin inscription beneath it translates as, and yet it was not consumed, the motto of Scottish Presbyterianism. Joseph Kennedy Jr., the eldest brother of American President John F. Kennedy. We are now approaching the main entrance to the American Memorial, where we will have a short break. If you wish to stay here for a while, you can join a later bus to return to the city. Thank you. 
of students here are trained as ministers for the Church of England. Ridley Hall is named to commemorate Nicholas Ridley, who was the chaplain to King Henry VIII. Ridley was burnt at the stake in Oxford in 1555, proclaiming that Mary I and the future Queen Elizabeth I were illegitimate children. our stop in Silver Street, which is one of the closest stops from the River Camp, Banks, and King's College Chapel. It is also the end of the tour for those who join us at Silver Street. This is the nearest stop to the main coach pickup and set down point in Queen's Road. If you are the at this point, we would like to thank you for travelling with City Sightseeing. We hope that you will enjoy your journey. Pitt Building, named after William Pitt the Younger, who studied at Pembroke College. He was the gentleman who kindly introduced income tax to this country as a temporary measure. So temporary, in fact, that most of us still pay the tax today. Cambridge University Press was granted its license in 1534 by King Henry VIII and holds the world record for the longest period of continuous printing and publishing. museums. The Sedgwick Museum, coming up on the right, is one of the best geological museums in the country. Exhibitions of fossil records take visitors on a trip through time, from the earliest life on the planet to the origins of modern. There are also galleries devoted to the history of planet Earth and to the diversity of the mineral kingdom. The Darwin Collection displays specimens collected by Charles Darwin during his voyage aboard the surveying ship HMS Beagle between 1831 and 1836. The museum is named after Adam Sedgwick, the man who taught Darwin about geology just before he made his voyage on the Beagle. statue of Lady Margaret, who is flanked by two mythical creatures called Yales. They have the head of a goat, the body of an antelope, and the tail of an elephant. Lady Margaret was engaged at the age of eight and married for the first time at the age of 14, the area in the summer where people come to enjoy themselves. It is possible, at certain times of the year, to take a boat trip along the river to the cathedral city of Ely, 15 miles away. On the far bank of the river, you may catch a glimpse of Jesus Green's swimming pool, Cambridge's largest pool, and one of the few remaining examples of the open-air swimming pools which were built across the country in the 1920s and 30s. To 
our left once again is the River Cam. You can see the weir, which marks the furthest point of navigation upstream for motorized vessels. This stretch of the river is often used for mooring quite claims and houseboats, an affordable and picturesque way to live in the expensive central to Gabies and Samuel Pepys, the famous diarist. If you look to your left as we cross the river bridge, you will see the Pepys Library behind the beautifully maintained gardens. There are only four round churches left in this country, and they were built to represent the circle of life, death, and the resurrection. James, Sir Derek Jacobi, Stephen Fry, and Hugh Laurie. One undergraduate failed his audition here, but went on to enjoy a 50-year career in Hollywood. His name was James Mason. Over the high wall to the front and right of the bus are the buildings of Sydney Sussex College, founded in 1596 by Lady Frances Sydney, Countess of Sussex. On April 23rd, 1616, Oliver Cromwell entered the college. He would later become the Lord Protector of England and opposed Royalist forces throughout the English Civil War. Look to your left at the traffic lights, and you will see the long, narrow passageway known as the Chin Room. This leads to the main entrance of Jesus College which was founded by Bishop John Orcock Peary in 1496. Immediately beyond the main entrance, you will see the College Chapel. Part of it is the original Norman Chapel dating back to 1150, which is the oldest college chapel here in Cambridge. Next to it, the new buildings house a library, built to mark the 500th anniversary of the college in 1996. Prince Edward, the youngest son of the Queen, was a student here. 